Welcome to Thrive and Advance podcast, where we help you make business growth predictable, profitable, and enjoyable. I'm your host, Dr. Shari Avdahin. This episode is the second part of three-part discussion with my good friends and colleagues, Terry Norbell, founder and president of Enterprise Inc., and Murray Januenski, the founder and president of Act One International, to further discuss the details of how to create sustainable growth. Welcome to both of you. It's so exciting to have you with us today to dig into stages of growth, each stage, what it entails, and give our audience a little bit more details. So before we start talking about the actual stages of growth and the characteristics and experiences that organizations have at each stage, um, I'd like to talk about two pain points that most organizations experience as they are um, going into one stage and transitioning to another. And uh, let's describe it in general what those two pain points are and when we'll cover more in detail as we talk about each stage. So Terry, could you tell us about the flood zone? Yes, and thank you for inviting me to be with you again today and your listeners. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, the flood zone, you know, it, it happens between stages um, one and, and or be, between um, one and two, three and four, five and six. And it happens when there's an increase in workload. There's just more going on. There's more to be done. And the typical reaction is to throw more people at it, which makes it more complicated because this model is built on the premise of as you add people, you add complexity. So here you are with all this work to do, throwing more people, not enough time to onboard, not enough time to get them set up to actually help solve the problem. And so it just compounds itself. And the flood zone is something that most, when I'm working with clients, they all go, oh yeah, that's exactly what was going on. It's so obvious, once you put a name to it, once you identify, it's easy to see, and it's easy to see, oh yeah, that's the reaction, let's choose a different way. Thank you, Terry. Murray, would you tell us about wind tunnel? Yeah, well, again, my pleasure to be back on this podcast with you, Shori and, and Terry. Um, so these transitions that take place, you know, once you land in one stage of growth, you, you're preparing for the next stage of growth and, and you're in transition all the time. And it's, it is chaos. And um, either way, if you don't address it, you, you're headed for, for some big trouble. But the wind tunnel happens when you've been growing the company and you get to a point where maybe the way you did it before isn't necessarily working anymore. So it's letting go of those methodologies and, and taking on new ones as, as you add people who might have some great ideas on doing things different. And, I know I've experienced it myself and probably still am guilty of saying, no, that's the way we've always done it and, and not letting go of that and, and allowing the company to keep growing. So that, that's the wind tunnel. Yes. So um, it comes to mind that when we throw people at um, the problem per se, uh, we're not considering how throwing people at problems is not considering how the job is getting done. So looking at the processes and whether um, uh, the processes are working with a, at a given stage is really important. Yeah, very true. Excellent. So um, we know that each company has a unique experience when they hit a specific um, uh, stage. So, Murray, would you tell us about the unique experiences that organizations have in stages one and two? Well, sure, and, and pretty exciting stages, and um, I can say I'm stage one right now, and it, it's still exciting, mm -hmm. and always looking for ways to grow, whether that's adding people or, or changing services. But if you, if you can imagine um, a company, and, and the label we put on stage one is actually startup. 
and, and it kind of speaks for itself. Entrepreneur gets a, a, a vision, an idea, and starts up the company. And at that point, what's happening is a lot of trial and error. There is no fixed processes. Um, and that's good. And, that, and that's what people like. As you start adding people, um, the, and, and which, of course, increases overhead, um, the name of the game in stage one is survival. And, and the risk is pretty high of, of things not working out. And in fact, if you do a little bit of research, it shows that a lot of businesses will fail 20% in the first year and 50% by the fifth year. So it's not um, impossible, um, but you have to keep that in mind because the, the whole idea really is survival. And when we talked last time about the, the different gates of focus of people, process, and profit, mm -hmm. in stage one, it is definitely profit and, and really keeping an eye on what's happening. And, and as you grow through stage one, so uh, again, that's one to 10 people, as you move towards stage two, you're going to have this flood zone that we already talked about because activity starts to really increase as you're increasing sales and adding people and, and needing more and more of everything. And that takes you towards stage two. Okay, so let me ask the primary goals first. Okay, well, the, the primary goals in a, in a startup company, when we say the number one challenge is profit or that's, that's the gate of, of focus, um, that, that's paramount to making sure that you've got people that fit, um, that, you know, as, as you're growing your company, you want people that are innovative, creative, and they really want to have that hard work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the goals of things that you need to be putting in, in place. Right. You know, I, I would also add is to get comfortable with chaos at stage one. There's so many hats that the, the owner, the, the person that starts a company, it, it's, it's organized chaos. It's how can you get through the day getting the highest priority tasks done, making money, and getting your services out there, your products out there. Right. Yeah. Not everybody's comfortable with chaos, and that's an essential component of stage one. Right. And within that chaos, that stage one is the time that um, the entrepreneur, the um, president, owner, CEO, whatever title, hat they wear, um, they have to make sure that they have a solid business model mm. because that will become foundational to the growth of the company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about the uh, builder protector? What is the builder protector ratio or ideal builder protector ratio at stage one? Yeah, well, as you can imagine, it's startup and it's go, go, go. So the, the ideal ratio is four to one builder to protector. So, you know, there's always got to be a little bit of caution to, to make sure you don't do things that are too crazy, but it's, it's a mindset. That, and in fact, that's the, the highest the ratio ever is, is in stage one. Right. So it's high risk. Everything about stage one is high risk, but you have to go out there and make it happen. You make it happen. And, and, and you know, you talked about sales and profit, and, and I know that, you know, so many people that I've met that they have this idea, oh, I'm going to start my own business. And whether that's building a product or providing a service, and whether it's um, business to business or to consumers, First question I always have is, do you know how to sell? Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, you either need to learn or hire somebody that does. Because just having this idea of, a, of the next better mousetrap will not get you there. Right, that's, that's very true. Boy, that's so true, Murray. I was talking with an entrepreneur earlier this week and she has partners and they're ready to launch and all of a sudden it hit her that she was the only one that had any capacity for marketing mm. and everybody was relying on her and she, they pulled the plug because why put any more time, effort, money into it when they didn't have the marketing mechanism. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so essential. Very true. What is the best way to address the flood zone at stage one? 
here we are, we're ranking up and we're cranking. We're, there are a lot of fast growing companies, right? If you see the 1000 fast growing company list from Inc every year, there are a lot of companies that are going in thousands percent. It's just not just yeah. 15%. And that within itself causes, puts so much stress on the organization. So what is the best way to address that transition of going from stage one to stage two so fast? Yeah, no, and that, that's a great question because that FUD zone as it appears between different stages will require um, to address it differently. Between stages one and two, if, if you look at what's happening, you're growing, so you're adding people and, and more overhead, that's the time when you need to make sure you start getting some processes in place that are consistent and not just doing whatever fits that day and um, making sure that you've got the capital to address what's coming at you, which is increased activity. Yes. I'd say that's the two key things. And also um, communicating with your people that, that this is okay. Um, uh, like we say, a healthy dose of chaos is good so that you're not stagnant because if you're stagnant, you're, you know, we talked last time about if you're not growing, you're dying. Well, that could be what's happening, and you got to be careful of that too. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd add that you also want to make sure that you have the right people in the right seats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next stage of growth, because those that were able to just do all hands on deck at stage one might not be, they might have reached the ceiling of what they can handle as you need them to take on more in an, in an organized, structured way. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about stage two. What what do we experience in stage two? Well, if you if you're doing well managing that chaos, you move into stage two, and that's defined as having eleven to twenty people, mm -hmm. and so it's getting bigger and more things to manage. So one of the and then we actually call that ramp up. So start up, you're getting things going, but now you got to ramp up and take that increased activity and and start organizing things in a way that, that you can make that happen. So the next transition, you know, as you're now preparing for stage three, um, is going to be a wind tunnel. And so during stage two, that's when it's important to let go of certain methodologies that didn't work. You're hiring. The number one challenge is hiring quality people. And as Terry said in stage one, even more important in stage two to have the right people in the right seats. And um, what you're really doing is motivating a small staff to move mountains. And, and that profit is still the, the, the number one gate of focus mm -hmm. and keeping an eye on, on cash flow. And that actually is the biggest risk in stage two is that if, if you're not watching the indicators, probably daily, um, but at least weekly, to make sure that everything's in place and you're not running out of capital because cash flow is, is the biggest risk in stage two. So in, in simple terms, um, it's very important to have established the key performance indicators, yeah. right? right? And today we are data junkies, right? <laughs> we look at data, 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 and that's what data gives us. If it's a clean data, so it's really important to pay attention what the data you're gathering is a clean data. If it's not, uh, bring someone in or have someone that would clean up the data. Then mm -hmm. you track, 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 and measure to make sure that you are staying profitable. Otherwise, everything you bring in will go, go out of the back door. I agree. Very good. Okay, so Terry, let's... Talk about stage three. Yeah. What do we experience in stage three? Oh, I love stage three. It's one of my favorite stages of working with entrepreneurs in that, and it can be managers, leaders, CEOs, founders, the hardest transition, hands down, is from stage two to stage three. Here's why. In stages one and two, it's CEO centric, it's owner centric, it's, it's leader centric. And at stage three, it becomes enterprise centric. It's the name of this stage is delegation because 
there has to be that letting go, that empowering. That's why at stage two, you want to make sure that you have the right people that you trust, you have a confidence level with, so that the CEO will, I, I guess, relinquish or let go of some of the, the duties that they are used to having to shoulder in the ramp up in the startup stages. And um, it, it can feel like a flood for the, the, the team members because as the owner is delegating, there's more being expected of each employee so that the organization keeps humming along in a more efficient and effective manner. You know, I'd like to give an example of the transition to stage three and then moving into stage four, because one of the rules is when you land in a stage, you start preparing for the next stage. I worked with two visionary clients, very different verticals, different, totally different markets. And yet they were both visionary when they started their businesses. They movers and shakers in their respective industries. And they went through the x-ray diagnostic process. And one of them at the outcome said, oh, yeah, no, I don't want to allocate 60% of my time, which is the time allocation of the manager, the leader at stage three. I, I, there's no way, you know, that I'll ever give 60% of my time. I'm going to need to bring in someone who will now manage my company so I can do my, you know, his genius work. The other CEO said, oh yeah, I don't want to let go of my baby. I want to learn and grow how, into how to be a CEO at stage three and stage four. So I love that example because the methodologies that this, this stages of growth matrix provide, it's like having a crystal ball and a roadmap. So the formulas are the same. They're so solid. They work. And yet how different organizations, different CEOs choose to use them is it's the science and the art. That's where the art form comes in. And um, they're, they're both very, very successful organizations now in stage four, moving to stage five. They just took very different paths. So, so anything to add about stage three? I mean, I love stage three. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Terry. And I, I have seen people, well, not, well, actually people, yeah, um, CEOs that have not let go, yet their company was still growing, so they, they managed to, to, and all the way up to stage seven, and they're still not letting go. Yeah. And, and when I've talked to them about that, you know, being able to use hindsight, um, it's, yeah, I, I should have paid more attention back at that stage. So it, it really is a critical stage. Yeah. Right. Understanding that most of us get into business by being, for lack of a better word, a technician, right? Mm -hmm. We know something, we have passion for something, we know how to do it, we get into business. But as the company grows, we have to let go give it to other people that have the competencies to carry on the actual work so the leader can become the visionary, can look at the big picture and take the company where it needs to go. So there is a trade-off. If you don't delegate, the trade-off is that you may lose the thread in your big picture. Where do the pieces fit and how do I want to grow it? That's a beautiful segue into stage four. <clears throat> because stage four is professional and the CEO has to be willing to hire people. Professional might need to be people that are coming from the outside at a higher level. And there's some vulnerability that goes with that because you want to hire people that compensate for areas that, that aren't your genius or aren't your strength or that build a, bring a skill set that you've never even thought to have in your organization. Hence professional. You know, people who have vision, perhaps, um, a proficiency that um, they have grown at another organization that, oh my gosh, they'll just help you take, go to the next level. Um, you know, really up-leveling mm -hmm. the, the people side as well. Stage four is up-leveling the processes. So stage four is, you know, the, the three gates of focus 
people profit process process goes as number one. And I pulled this master process list out because it came in so beautifully with a client recently. There's four master processes that organizations are well served to look at. Financial, customer intelligence, sales. There we go back again to sales, uh, marketing, production, operations. The list goes on and, and all of them really need to be factored in so that foundation is set at stage four to move on to stage five. Yeah, uh, I agree, Terry. And, and um, hiring those managers that have those transferable skills can really help. Mm -hmm. I, I also believe, and I've seen it work uh, uh, in some cases where you can develop yes. a professional manager, but I think you really need to start doing that in stage three before you get to stage four. Totally. Um, I have worked with two organizations uh, recently that uh, each one of them um, really had to address what you just talked about, having professionals at this stage. And that um, causes, may cause two issues that the leaders need to really understand and work through. One is what you just mentioned, if you have people that have the talent, you have to have a solid training and development program in place. So you can expand your people's capacities. So when you hit the higher stages, they are ready to fill in the positions. Now in one organization, they had not done that. So basically they took the jobs and fit it to people. Mm. And now they're at the, at the point that they have to let all these people go because they can't afford to fit the job to people. They need to have the right person for the job. Mm -hmm. So it really created um, a difficult scenario for everyone in the organization. Some of them had worked with the company 25 years. Yeah. So, um, and the other piece is if you are hiring professionals, you have to look at proper pay rate. You can't hire experienced professionals with higher capacity for um, um, entry level That's pay. Right. So these are the two things that I've seen organizations have, have had to really tackle before they can really manage those stages. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, such great points. And, and, brought to my mind another aspect that we haven't touched on the training piece absolutely and and hiring at a higher level paying at a higher level and what goes along with that is making sure stage one and two yes absolutely at three that the mission is created the vision is solid the values which drive behavior all those foundational components the culture really it's pivotal at stage three, moving into stage four. And that's why stage one, it is so crucial that the entrepreneur uh, starts looking at building, developing a solid business model mm -hmm. because a business model will include all those points. And as you're going from stage to stage, you're developing and growing that business model. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, fair enough. Excellent. So, Murray, how about stage uh, five and six? Well, um, again, very, it's all really, really interesting. And stage five, um, I've, I've just been working with a stage five company. And interestingly, they went completely through stage four last year. Mm -hmm. Now they're in stage, and they're actually almost at the end of stage five, which is 58 to 95 people. They're at just over 90 and still hiring. So they're heading to stage six. So it's really, really important right now for them to look at what are, what are the rules for, for stage five. Mm -hmm. And the label that we give to stage five is integration. And there's a lot of things that need to be integrated, but one of the uh, things that's top of the list is integrating that executive team mm -hmm. into a highly cohesive team where they know they've got each other's backs. If that isn't done, you end up with silos if they're not already there. Um, especially, you know, in stage four, Terry, when you talked about hiring some of the outside managers or people from other companies, 
that can really, really work. It can also start creating silos because of egos, to, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to build that cohesive team because if you don't, um, and I know another stage five company that I was working with last year, we had the, the VP, of, VP of sales and marketing saying things like, well, my focus is sales. I got a great team around me. I don't care what these other guys are, are doing. I, that's my team. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of work to pull that executive team together and get them to start thinking that the executive team is their primary team. Yes, when they're, when they're not meeting with the executive team and they're out um, managing and motivating their own team, of course, that's, that's primary. But when we're talking about the whole business, um, we've got to look at what's happening across the organization and not just in one, one place. And, uh, you know, you will have, coming in stage five, you will have come through the wind tunnel. And then heading to stage six, you got to be thinking about we're going to have another flood zone. You know, we're adding, we're up over 90 people. And the reason for that is a, a flood of activity. Hey, so Mark, comes hey, Mark, up, can, I, can yeah. I jump in and add to your, your silo comment? Because that is so solid. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a research project interviewing a variety of um, sea level uh, folks a few months ago. And that silo concept that you're talking about really one of the top issues in organizations of all sizes. It's, it's prevalent. And uh, so I just wanted to share that how important what you're saying to mitigate that silo mentality. Wow. Organizations could go so much farther, so much faster. Yeah, I, I agree. Having been in um, a corporate setting for so many years, um, this is the best way I can describe what you just said. We constantly said the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Mm -hmm. So most people have experienced that. And when that comes up, um, processes don't work because there are interdependencies. Mm -hmm. When the interdependencies have not been considered, that's when the sales department is doing one thing and the marketing is doing something separate if they're siloed. Um, departments and actually each of those uh, processes that you mentioned uh, Terry that in earlier stage they have to be considered and processed reprocessed we talk about process re-engineering and all that it really comes into play because those processes you just named the list they become departments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's when the silo happens. Each department now has their own processes without any understanding of or consideration for the interdependencies uh, for themselves or for other departments they work with. So that silo business is um, pretty dangerous. Well, well, it is because, and, and so we want to integrate the executive team, but we also want to integrate all the departments for the reasons you just said, uh, sorry, and that that is to get those efficiency because when when you're up you know approaching over 90 and getting towards 100 people if you don't have those efficiencies then the competition is going to take it away from you that's right because again back to what's the number one challenge and in stage five it's sales once again and it, without those efficiencies it's hard to sell 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 and uh, the competition nips away at it right yeah it affects your customers too we talked about company has to be customer centric if you're putting the customer at the center of every decision it means that every department the processes how would impact how would it impact the customer and when the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing the person that suffers the most is the customer so therefore um you the attrition comes into play yeah. Excellent. How about stage six? Yeah, well, then what happens is you're now transitioning through a flood zone and getting into stage six, which is 96 to 160 people. And you can see how the, the bandwidth of each stage is getting larger and larger. You know, for example, in, in stage one, if you, if you add one person, it, it changes the whole organization in terms of what you're doing. 
in, in stage six, 96 to 160, um, adding one person doesn't necessarily upset the a- apple cart. But as you're adding people, especially if you're growing quickly, um, it does start to make a difference. That's why it was so important to have that integration in, in stage five. But stage six, we call strategic. Mm-hmm. And now the focus becomes, instead of just looking at what are we going to do this year, having a, a, a good forecast and, and operational plan, we're re- it's imperative to look out three plus years and be very strategic. And um, people becomes the primary focus in that strategic stage. And um, getting staff buy-in, you can imagine if you've got well over 100 people now and getting that alignment becomes a real challenge. And, and so it means communicate, communicate, communicate. And so the risk at stage six becomes too little, too late. Mm-hmm. If you're not looking ahead, um, at least three years on what's our vision, what's coming at us, what's changing, um, and you don't identify it until it's too late, well, then that's when the competition is just going to jump on. That, that's stage six. And you know, that speaks to what we've been addressing, the importance of the processes, the importance of having the hiring criteria and the values and using values and who you hire. I remember seeing a video, of Tony Shea, you know, of Zappos. And he was talking about why he sold his first company mm-hmm. because it wasn't fun to come to work anymore. They, they had let go. They, A, they didn't have the processes. They didn't know they needed them back then. And so as they kept hiring and getting to those, those bigger numbers of employees, they they weren't hiring people congruent with who they wanted to be. And it wasn't fun. And how, isn't that a great luxury to have? I'm not having any fun. I think I'll sell my company. You know, yes. it's just brilliant. And yet it speaks to the importance. So when, when Zappos was acquired, he was so firm in it, we must be able to maintain the culture the way we want the culture in hiring to fit our culture because at that strategic level, it's so important. Yeah, and, and to tag on to that, Terry, um, so again, hiring the right people and using the values to make sure you get the right people. Another thing that becomes paramount in stage six is to have, uh, we'll call it new staff orientation. Um, and not that it shouldn't be happening at previous stages, but now it becomes absolutely imperative. And we're talking two to three days. And that isn't orientation like here's your desk and here's your phone and, and, and here's our file system. It's, it's really focusing on the, the, the culture and the values of the company and, and how the company works. And I, I worked with one stage six company that did, I, I think, a tremendous job of that. And it wasn't, they, they had three day orientation and it wasn't three days in a row, but they did two days in a row and then they came back later for another day and they had the executive in there speaking to how the company has grown, what the values are. And they had little breakout activities and I thought it was wonderful. And and I I think that's really important at stage six. You know, employee engagement, um, obviously is the buzzword these days. Everybody's looking at how do I increase, um, my company's, um, or the employee engagement at my company, uh, there is a challenge. And that is companies strive to be on the list of best place to work. I've recently worked with a couple of companies that they have that designation, but when you go into the organization, you observe and do the interviews and do the uh, diagnostics, the employees aren't really engaged, but they, it is so free for all that they're comfortable to be there. They make good money because the, the pay rate is high and um, the job load is really not that much. The workload isn't that much. At the same time, they can come and go, they get treated, they've got breakfast, they go, um, they have a quarterly employee events, this and that and the other. Um, so it's really imp- employee friendly but there really isn't any measure of performance. Yeah. 
So yeah. therefore the company suffers. Yes. Um, so employee engagement is not to just give a lot of fluff to the employees. It, 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 it matters when, it matters when uh, employees feel they have a voice, what they do matters to the company, to the outcome, and um, they are also held accountable. Yes. Believe it or not, people respond better to accountability than free-for-all fluff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've seen several examples of companies thinking, if I just give more, if I have an open door, come and go, work at home, do whatever, my employees will be engaged and there is nothing mm. close to truth to that. So, yeah. So yeah. Well said. Well, and, and you know, when we talk about engagement and I, I think one measurement would be, and it's not easy to measure, but it would be how happy are people. But what I, I a colleague of mine told me um, a, a while back, a few years ago, he said, you know, when you hear that saying that happy people are productive people, he says it's actually the other way around. You know, productive people are happy, happier. Mm -hmm. And and so the, this whole idea of engagement, Shori, and I, I agree it's a buzzword out there today, and what I love in this model, they don't use that word, they use voltage. And, and I think that conjures up a, a certain image. And I was working with a stage one company just last week, five people, and we were talking about voltage. And... Um, just to cut right to it, the aha at the end of our session was just one person in one sentence can change the voltage of their whole company for the day. And, and then, you know, I came back and said yes, and one other person can change it back in one sentence. So that might be obvious when you've got five people working together on, on the impact that one person can have very quickly, up or down with the voltage. But what's happening in uh, the later stages, and right now we're on stage six, so you got over 100 people. It's happening in little pots yeah. all over the organization. And, and so it, it, it's still uh, so fundamental to get, to get that productivity is to have the right voltage. Yeah. yeah. Very and true. Energy is, is so important. And, mm -hmm. and the couple words that have been coming um, to the surface lately are that people want to have a sense of progress. They want to know they're making progress towards something and they want that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily public, you know, big to do, just that people want, uh, they're motivated, they're encouraged by that sense of, oh, somebody's noticing me that I'm making a difference here. So progress and acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. That's right. Excellent. So, uh, Terry, let's talk about stage seven. Stage seven. Yes, yes. So 161 to 500. And um, it's, it's capped at 500 because um, the government says small business, entrepreneurial business is up to 500 employees. It's a very different stage because that is a lot of employees that you're now needing to put some organization to. Um, the, the name of this stage is visionary, and it's where the, the leader, the CEO, whatever role that the title is, they truly go back to having that visionary, where are we going? And, and how I look at this is like a, that captain at the front of the, the ship, you know, like looking out on the horizon. Not that that person has to be the one that's creating it, yet somebody has to own the responsibility of of championing the, the executives to make sure they're going in a coherent direction. Another thing we like to say is that the, the company is more like a cruise liner than a speedboat now. And yet at that stage, companies can get complacent. They can rest on what has been achieved and yet no, um, hence so much of the CEO's time really does need to be allocated to this visionary component. It's the highest of all the different categories, 75 kind of their time. Like that's the highest. And, and here's why. Somebody has to make sure that entrepreneurial spirit is still alive. 
that sense of creativity and innovation. And if you stop and think about the, the companies that are prevalent today that have maintained that entrepreneurial, that innovation, you know, who comes to mind? Most likely Apple, you know, they're really out there. Um, and, and, you know, somebody has to take that on and be responsible. And that's a, that's a stage seven role of the CEO, the, the owner, the leader, the manager at that level. That's right. Um, stage seven um, is uh, reaching a point that one person can't just, there is no way one person can control it all. So uh, that executive team, and you use the word coherence, and I love that word, the coherence between the executive team is important at every stage, but the larger the organization gets, the tighter the coherence between the executive team has to be because that's how they can ensure that the, uh, the mission, the vision, the value, the, uh, what they set out to do, the culture they want to have will continue the same way. Otherwise it will unravel. Now there is something I'd like to mention to our audience. All those stages of growth stops at 500 because it is focused on small businesses. However, Larger organizations can still utilize stages of growth at either divisional or departmental level, which still brings about the coherence they're looking for. I started working with um, an enterprise organization with their marketing, and uh, that has now spread to four other departments, and um, it's helping them at that high number of employees, large enterprise level, they're bringing about some um, coherence, some um, alignment. And alignment is a big word, right? It's used all the time, but what does it really mean? It means that everything works together. Right. If your car is out of alignment, what happens? Your tires will wear out, your car will be damaged one way or another. So alignment is really important. And all that means is every wheel is, is oiled and um, well functioning together. So larger organizations can use the model at that level. Yes. Yeah. You're right, um, Shori, that that alignment, that can be a buzzword too, but you know, it really means having buy-in, which, which doesn't mean that um, everybody totally agrees with every decision that, that's made. Um, there was a study that I was privy to a couple of years ago. Um, it was done by Wiley, uh, the publishing company. And the number one thing that came out of it was, uh, in terms of what people want, if you take compensation out of it, the number one thing that employees want is to have their ideas heard and considered. And even if they don't get implemented, at, at least, hey, if I've been heard, I can buy in. Yes, having a voice is really important. Yeah. 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 Terry, I like your uh, an analogy about the, the cruise ship. And 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 because if you think about it, at stage one, and if we just imagine the three of us being a stage one company and we're in a rowboat, and Terry decides to stop rowing, I mean, there's the voltage right there. Like now all of a sudden we're having to pick up the slack and it's harder to do. It's really hard to do. Right. Our stage seven company, you know, the problem is you get that large, people can hide yeah. mm -hmm. and, and stop doing their job, stop rowing, so to speak. And the more that happens, the more the voltage um, decreases. And, and that's where that executive team need, needs to be making sure they keep the voltage up and, and um, keep everybody rolling. That's right. You know, that, Murray, that reminds me of one of the winning formulas, I, I guess, or a a, a technique or a tactic, let's call it a tactic, that comes into play is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So that right. each person has that one-on-one, -on -one, no more than what, 15, 20 minutes, a max of 30 minutes a week, so that they can be heard. So that whatever is blocking them can be cleared out of the way. And here's why this popped into my head, because imagine, if each manager asked their employees, the one-on-ones are only with direct reports, right? Mm -hmm. To increase their 
performance or their productivity by 1% Mm -hmm. for the next week. If everybody in the organization was just increasing by 1%, oh my gosh, that that place would be on fire. Mm -hmm. It's just we, we oftentimes don't stop to think about what could I do that would move the business forward and allow me to use my genius work, what I bring to the organization that is uniquely my contribution. I mean, that's how companies can really, at stage seven in particular, can stay lit up. You know, it's um, interesting. One-on-ones have so many different connotations. The one that is most used is if you're in trouble, then I'll be talking to you. And um, I keep reminding uh, the leaders that I work with that one, one-on-one should be consistent with everyone, whether they're in trouble or not. And that's probably how you can um, head off the folks that will get into trouble because you're having the one-on-one. And the response I mostly get is, I don't have time to sit down, talk to 10 people every week. And the question that I ask them is, how many fires do you put out every week? And how many of them are created by the employees you don't talk to? So um, it's a catch 22, but just if you put the uh, effort forward and do what needs to be done, a lot of other headaches will go away. That's right. You know, when you said that, it made me think about a manager I was working with and And she was going to roll out the one-on-ones and just a couple questions like, you know, what is success is that have that you've had so she can start with pats on the back and, and what are you working on for this next week? And, and she said, what if, what if I get an answer that I don't agree with? I'm like, well, that would be a good thing, you know, because then you can nip it and you can redirect. Right. It's like, that has always stuck with me because yeah, that's why you want to have the one-on-ones. You want to make sure that, Marie, to your word, there's that alignment, there's that um, synergy in, in going towards the goals, the KPIs that, that's going to move the business forward. That's right. Just because you don't get the response doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Doesn't mean that its impact isn't there. So well said. Excellent. What else would you like to add? I don't know. I feel like that, that's a pretty darn good summary of, of seven stages, and which is a lot. You're going from one to 500 people. Yes, yes. This concludes uh, this episode of our podcast. Great information shared. Thank you, Marie and Terry, for joining and uh, really enlightening all of us. So we appreciate that. At closing, I like to ask our audience to do one thing. Sit down with the information given. Think about where your company's at. Which stage are you in? What needs to be done? And if you need help, reach out to us. Go to the website at thrivance.com, complete a complimentary survey, and we'll be happy to send you a full report on the stage you're in and the areas of focus. At this point, we'll say goodbye until the next episode where we dive into more detail in seven stages of growth and what we all experience. With that said, thank you very much.